want to take a look at that's in that middle space that's hard for people to understand. We're talking about investing not just in companies, but in the sector. Can you explain that idea? I think that's challenging for some people. Yeah, <coughs> maybe we're, we're dealing with stuff too frequently, but it seems fairly straightforward to me in some sense. So there's one core concept that has been consistent throughout the history of the Mayor Network, which is to think about sectors. You know, how do we advance the entire sector? We talked about yesterday the extent to which entire sectors are really how you get a scale. Individual firms are great, but you get them. to scale, you need multiple firms competing in a vibrant marketplace. Mm -hmm. like so define a sector. Uh, industry sector is um, uh, uh, something like uh, microfinance, or uh, we're talking about we're just talking about here about uh, mobile money. Uh, various industry segments that are comprised of firms and uh, infrastructure that supports those firms, and the policy environment that also supports those firms. So getting getting back to your to your original question, we always thought about moving entire sectors. Um, how we've evolved is initially we said, okay, in order to move sectors, we we'll buy grant capital, as you mentioned, and we'll invest in firms that we think can generate those adjusted returns. It's market rate returns. Market rate returns. And we were nervous about going less than market rate returns because we thought, hey, maybe that'll distort markets and we'll get you know, some sloppy investors. But what we realized is there was a lot of early stage firms that were not only assuming regular business rates. We're also assuming risk for the sector, right? They were out there, they were cutting edge, they were de-risking an idea or a new model. And that even if they failed, they were still delivering enormous value in terms of driving that sector. There's forward. the evolution of that sector of education or medical technology or something. Right? Correct. So, so we were hopeful that they would succeed. Everybody wants these firms to succeed. But even if they don't, they were having you know, a public good for the sector. So, the right. so then we said, hey, on one hand, we're pushing the risk of just returns. Mm -hmm. But if we push for risk adjusted returns in all circumstances, then effectively we're not recognizing the value that some of these firms can deliver to the sector, right. even if they don't generate risk adjusted returns. Right. So that's how we started to begin to think about right. maybe investing in firms that may not generate risk adjusted returns. Right, so the firms that don't go to market rate. And yet, as an investor, when you talk about this, investing in a sector, that's the job of a foundation, that's the job of government, that's the public good. Investors are not about, you know, you want the impact and you want the return, but you're saying, how do I think of myself as an investor if I'm not capturing the value? I mean, if it's a public good, you're not capturing the value, you're delivering the value to everybody else. Yeah. How do I think differently about myself as an investor if I actually live and do that? It, I guess it really depends on how, how you define investment. Mm -hmm. right, if you're purely a financial investor, then you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. right. If you're just looking at returns, there are a whole host of things you can invest in and generate nice returns. Mm -hmm. um, we call ourselves in the VR network a philanthropic investment firm. So we consider ourselves investors, absolutely. But we're investors in sector development. We're investors in positive social change. And my sense is that people are looking to move beyond sort of this, this, this narrow sense of what an investor is and think about more broadly how you're going to so in that sense, if you're an investor in social change, you don't always need to capture all of the financial value that's being created in the system. And so if I deliver this public good along with my investment, which is what SOCAP is about, how do I look at that public good? Do I have to be really granular about measuring all of the impact and send consultants along to, to find all of that? But how do I know the good I've done? It's, it's, it's hard. A lot of these things are, are extremely difficult. But incredibly important to do. I think uh, there is an element of measurement. I think we're seeing real progress on the measurement front. And I think there is an element of, you know, when we see it, you know, we've talked about Bridge, we've talked about Remy um, uh, and what they did. Uh, one of the ways you can measure success is okay, if I invest in an organization that's developed a model that is now being replicated by others. Mm -hmm. So did it start with a single firm? I invest in that initially at early, that, that early stage firm. And are we now seeing other? Uh, copycats mm -hmm. or, or others who are trying to innovate on that model. So you don't want your innovation to be defensive. You want it to be replicable. You want to see copycats. You want to see other people doing that. That's a sign of success. I think that's absolutely one of the signs of success. So it's completely different from traditional technology investment where you want to say, what's my barrier to entry? Yeah. I want to see what's my way of having multiple children yeah. and, uh, have the, the same genes. And there's an interesting point in here. Um, we, there's the old adage of, 
complex gets measured, gets managed. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that there are there is an emergence of measurement systems in impact investing with GERS and IRAs, and that is fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me it would be good if there was an emergence of some mechanisms to measure sector performance and sector development. Mm -hmm. Right? And then people will begin to think about more more uh, uh, more strongly. You know, this, is, this, yeah. this is a new way of thinking. I mean, you know, a mini art has the ability to have what you call flexible capital. So you can invest sometimes, you can donate sometimes, and you have the resources to do that. A fund that sets up in the space has, you know, a, a internal rate of return, limited partners. How can a fund or a traditional investor or an impact investor look at doing this kind of thing and, and telling its story? Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, we, we are incredibly fortunate uh, to have a very generous family. Um, that understands and is committed to and pushes us to think about the importance of the mm -hmm. sector. Um, I think it is really important to have different types of capital. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the, uh, uh, Anthony and Catherine and Judith were talking last night uh, about thinking about the, the problem first and then figuring out how to address that problem. Mm -hmm. the problem first, capital type. Yeah. Capital. Now we're fortunate because we have a flexible capital, as you right. know. I think the point isn't that everybody should have a flexible capital. The point is that there are multiple large pools of capital out there. Mm -hmm. Each of those pools of capital is seeking a different result. Mm -hmm. And collectively, we think that we can move sectors. Now, the gap we see, there's enough capital out there. The big gap we see is right. early stage investing, right. real innovative company. Right. We talk about why that is. Uh, and early stage investment in infrastructure and in policy. So those are the biggest gaps we see that I think if we if we can direct a little more capital that way, uh, uh, we, can, we can be much more. Let's take those one at a time. Early, there is not enough risk capital early stage. Why not? And what needs to happen to make that happen? I think you hit on the primary reason why not. The, the difficulty of getting risk adjusted returns. Yeah. You're dealing, if you, if you go very early stage, you're dealing high risk, highly uncertain returns, very difficult environment. And also one thing that's not talked about a lot is transaction costs. I mean, for many folks, doing a doing a two hundred fifty thousand dollar deal uh, in terms of getting that done is as costly as doing a two million dollar deal or a twenty million dollar deal. Same kind of cost. Same kind of cost. And if you're doing that two hundred thousand dollar deal, you also got a lot of human capital costs, right? Because typically you're dealing with a very early stage entrepreneur, and you want to be spending a lot of time about that. So I think that's probably the fundamental reason: is it's 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 expensive and it's difficult and and, and uh, it's complicated. But again, it's incredibly, incredibly important. So does that mean the mid-air is going to do more $250,000 deals? Are you going to put things out in these sectors to say, I've got a, you know, people have been through the accelerator programs, I got $100,000. There's a, a huge $250,000 to a million dollar gap yeah. that those kind of deals. Yeah. Will the mid-air be doing that kind of stuff? We, we will do things to support that kind of stuff. But we also realize that we have a cost structure right. that doesn't make it terrible, it doesn't make us terribly able to deal with the $250,000 deal. But we are looking at supporting organizations that can. Uh, one organization that we're really excited about that we have supported for some time is Endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably know of Endeavor. And they are not uh, focused on disadvantaged populations on the OP per se. They're focused on building kind of vigorous entrepreneurial ecosystems. Right. And they're absolutely supporting high impact entrepreneurs who are, who are just starting out and showing some, some, some early traction. Right. And again, there's other players, there's an uh, Abishkar in, in India that goes uh, right. early stage. And so we want to do the things that foster those kind of things. Right. And what is, is needed to create more endeavors, Abishkars, or in the US, the village capitals, or whatever? What would your role be to support those kinds of groups? It, 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 it depends. I mean, it, it varies, right? And uh, it really depends upon the market. One of the things we haven't uh, touched upon is in as much as we talk high level, uh, we've got to move the market sectors. Yeah. The work of doing that is specific to a country, it's specific right. to a sector, it's specific right. to a point in time. Um, so it's really getting that 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 local knowledge, building that local knowledge is really important. So we we have a, a, a significant team in, in Mumbai. Uh, we're building a team in Johannesburg to, to get us sort of closer to the closer to the investment, right. closer to those entrepreneurs. Right. What's really at stake here? Why should you care about the sector-based approach? And what's really different? About yeah, I think um, if you if you look at a an individual firm, 
Uh, you may be, if that firm is incredibly successful, you may be giving back a couple million. I mean, use the example of Ramin yesterday, right? Ramin serves 8 million borrowers, fabulous, right? Terrific. Uh, but they, they and a few others spark an innovation to serve 200 million. Um, so that's what's really at stake here. And, 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 but it, I think it's going to take us acting differently. You know, I'll come back to, um, we've titled the blog series, Prime to the Pump. Because what we're seeing in the sector right now, our sense is that we have an exponential increase in the amount of interest and the money flowing into the impact investment. Mm -hmm. The challenge is everybody seems to want high financial returns and high social impact. Right. That's a bit of a free book money, right? You, you get a book, you get a book. <coughs> Some question what, what is new there, right? Because if you're going to generate financial risk adjusted returns anyway, that money should, should flow. Mm -hmm. But we have a sense that everybody's waiting for those fabulous deals. And nobody's actually doing the hard work up front that makes those fabulous deals ultimately right. possible. Right. And, and so that's what, that's what we're concerned about, is how can we get people to go earlier stage? By the way, I do think there are some earlier stage investments that can generate risk adjusted returns. One of the things we focused on at focus on our network, and one of the reasons we try and develop local knowledge and knowledge in areas like um, uh, mobile payments, is that will enable us to cite these terrific, find these terrific opportunities which can generate risk adjusted returns, right? Like typical commercial capital markets just wouldn't be, have the, uh, the knowledge of the sector and the geography to believe that they can generate risk adjusted returns. We can go in there and, and be confident that we can. And those are the kind of investments we really like to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Foundation is mostly grant and PRIs are such a tiny slice in commission related investments, program related. Mm -hmm. How do you get foundations to take some risk and to play this role of uh, investing for public good? in early stage risky investments. Yeah, I think the foundations are one source of capital. We can talk about others as well. Um, I think they're, first of all, it's important to recognize that program-related investments for people who don't know about them here uh, enable foundations to invest in uh, profit-making entities. Um, and, and there's a lot of talk about program-related investments. But as you know, still 99% of money from foundations goes to grants. Right. And even if the 1% that remains, only 5% of that 1% goes to equity investments, which are the most catalytic early stage. Right. Now, I think there is some positive movement there. Gates is doing some interesting things. Rockefeller is doing some interesting things. But it will take a while before, uh, before they, they, they um, I think, can make a, a massive impact in that arena. Uh, I do think foundations have other roles that can play. Uh, rent capital is highly relevant. In fact, rent capital is one of the scarce uh, forms of capital out there. And foundations also historically have done a nice job thinking about systems and thinking about sectors and thinking about um, uh, uh, policy. Right. And you know, most, a lot of it has been U.S. focused. There's still a lot to do there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they also can be quite constructive in the developing world. But we looked at what uh, Judith was on the stage yesterday. You look at what Rockefeller was doing. Yeah, you, you see what Rockefeller has done with impact investing, I really quote infrastructure for impact investing with, with the gin and, and GERS and IRIS and other things. So I think foundations can absolutely play a role here. It's just uh, uh, changing, I think that what's required is a bit of change of focus. Uh, I think foundations historically seen the role as addressing market failures rather than making markets. And, and so I think that's a, that's a bit of a philosophical shift. But again, there are a lot of innovative uh, several of the other foundations out there, I think, can make that shift. Right. So when you say that foundations have been addressing market failures, going where the market doesn't go, and not creating the market, if you had a foundation, not the Immediate Network that is not a foundation, what would you do to move that foundation? How can you get people to take the sector approach and build the market that then enables the market-based solutions that are going to be the scalable answers? Yeah, I think, well, boy, um, I think there are several things that one could think about doing. I think uh, on the on the investments piece, I think it's, it's it's difficult to do a lot of early stage equity investing in a uh, in a foundation structure as it is today. I mean, my some of my sort of more radical suggestions are maybe foundations need to create a, a separate or parallel entity that looks at investments because it's a different skill set, it's a different mentality. Uh, I do think that foundations are adept at thinking around policy and infrastructure issues. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of whether they want to change strategy in certain points. Mm -hmm. right. You talked about supporting infrastructure for these 
building the second. Can you talk about what you mean by that? Yeah. It's just it's the it's the overall environment in which the uh, in which the firms exist. The example I cited last night uh, was some work that McKinsey and Company did in India, mm -hmm. uh, where they looked at what it would take to build the infrastructure uh, for medical technology mm -hmm. and its rating agencies and skills development and its policy, all of those which are uh, elements in the broader system that then create the soil in which these firms can sprout. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, mobile payments, mobile money, GSMA does some terrific work, mm -hmm. uh, some intellectual capital they contribute to the space. Um, and we talked about the policy front, we just announced at uh, CGI our commitment to the Better Than Cash Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, focused on uh, mobile, getting governments and private sector firms to develop further on mobile payments. And the three countries have actually signed up the principles and are focused on putting a lot of their transfer payments through mobile money, mm -hmm. which can uh, effectively bring the many of the disenfranchised who aren't, don't have access to the, uh, to the Main Street financial system into that financial system because you'll be sending them transfer and other payments and effectively creating bank accounts. So those are those are examples of kind of infrastructure and policy that can help the sector. So what is the role of government? I mean this is we're talking about the public good that you have the firm, it's a little capsule of value and you get that money back as an investor. We're talking about investing in the public good of these whole sectors of things that, you know, essentially the roads, the highways, the, the phone lines, the What's the role of government now, and what's the role the government should take? I, I think government plays an absolutely critical role. Uh, again, with, with uh, Judith and Catherine and Anthony, they hit on that point, actually. Uh, they, they, that was a point of departure. I think Catherine said that's one of the central things she's learned, mm -hmm. is that government's important. And sometimes, even as we embrace market solutions, we forget that the government has a legitimate role to play. And um, one of the things that I thought about a lot was the crisis in Andhra Pradesh, mm -hmm. right, where and there's, you can hear different versions of, of, of why things happen, right. but ultimately... When they stopped allowing my finance. Yes, ultimately, the, the, there was uh, obviously the, the commercial microfinance players and the government were not aligned. Right. And you had a disruption in the market which resulted in 10 million people uh, being disenfranchised from access to financial services. So that's, that's a horrible thing. cut off my at the state level because they said that this sector sucks here. It, that, yes, I won't get into the politics of it, but the, 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 the fundamental point is there was a, it was a misalignment mm -hmm. uh, of understanding of incentives, name it, you name it, that led to a massive disruption that just hurt a lot of people and it set the industry back years. And I think what people, this is not a one-off in Nicaragua, they have the Nopaco no movement where, where the government said you shouldn't be paying uh, uh, these microfinance institutions and that uh, led to the collapse of the microfinance industry there as well. And it's not just microfinance. I think you need to be sensitive that any time you are uh, serving the poor in a market-based way and generating return, you're going to have people who uh, see themselves as, as Defenders of the interests of the poor want to know what's going on and want to make sure that, that right. there are consumer protections in place, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. And if you don't have a good understanding between government and, and, and the business community about what you're collectively trying to accomplish, it can lead to these sorts of, of, uh, of conflicts that are, are frankly bad for everybody. So I think that's a big uh, that's a big lesson learned that actually is not talked about much. The other thing is the flip side: government can be incredibly constructive. Mm -hmm. in terms of helping big sectors forward. Mm -hmm. The example I said last night was in Bangladesh with the credit facility for the purchase of home solar systems. Mm -hmm. And in, in Bangladesh, there's 750,000 households with home solar systems. Right. That and really the the was, to, was to simply uh, creating a, a credit facility, right? And working, working constructively with a few private sector players uh, to, to get the market going. So I think government can play an incredibly important role. Right. You know, the, I think the most important thing is establishing a great competitive environment in which firms can compete. Ultimately, my personal point of view is the way you get prices down and quality up is, 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 is not through heavy-handed regulation, but ensuring that there's appropriate consumer protections and then vigorous competition among many players who are aggressively trying to win over the consumer. Mm -hmm. I think that's really right. important. Right. So what, what, as you're looking at the places you look, what would you want to change about the role of government? Well, I think it's a difficult one. Um, 
governments, governments are of course uh, comprised of, of individual, frequently elected officials, as well as the, as well as the the, the agencies of support. I think it, it's so variable by by country and by yeah. state. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I would say I want to change government, um, but I would I would advise I would advise uh, entrepreneurs and business leaders mm -hmm. to more constructively engage with government so that they have a common understanding, or hopefully a common understanding right. of what needs to be done to serve the, to, to, to serve. Entrepreneurs often race forward to create a solution and don't think about government except as maybe a barrier. Yes, I, I, I think that's that's probably true. And we've seen several instances where, where that has come back to, 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 to damage the individual firms. I think it's a critical issue in, in the U.S. I think government plays even a more significant role in many of the developing world countries, it's even more important than that. Right, yeah. So you did this six-part blog series, and I confess I read all of them last week, and it's been a little involved this week. <laughs> I haven't read it, but what was your goal in doing this blog series? Why a blog series? And then who, whose opinion do you want to change? Who do you want to influence? Yeah. Uh, we really want to share the ideas and the learnings. Um, we've been at this now for eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, because we invest across the returns continuum, from grants to, 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 to investments where we expect our suggested right. returns, everything in between. Right. We're actually, I think, well positioned to see the tension, or some of the tensions that occur when we're trying to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we just felt this, it was, it, was, it was about time to kind of put our thoughts out there, mm -hmm. share what we've learned, mm -hmm. spark a discussion. A lot of the issues that emerge are very nuanced. Mm -hmm. right? The whole issue of, of public goods and you know, the, the, the market innovator generating public goods for the development sector, mm -hmm. or the related issue of, of a firm subsidy. Too often we get into this subsidy is good, subsidy is bad. Mm -hmm. We're trying to say, hold on, these, these are very nuanced, very, very uh, uh, challenging, very, very important issues. Mm -hmm. So we thought we'd just put out the ideas, the lessons mm -hmm. learned there, right. hopefully spark discussion or debate, hopefully a little bit of insight. Uh, when we were talking about this, we said, look, this is not, this is not the recipe mm -hmm. uh, for impact investing, but we're hopeful that there are a few interesting ingredients here right. that people can, can emerge and can take away and advance. What do you see is, who would you see using your ideas and then what are the most easy, what are the one or two or three easiest ideas to use out of those ideas? I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, even as we say, or as we say, we need to shift the curve and go earlier stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I think foundations have a role to play in that. Uh, and are looking at the space. So I'm hopeful that uh, foundations and foundation professionals and leaders will, will take a look and engage in the conversation. Um, one of the pools of capital that we, we talked about last night was ultra high net worth individuals. Uh, I, when we got to put those numbers together, I, probably, I was as stunned as I think as some of the people in the audience were in terms of you know, Forbes 400 and controlling $1.7 trillion. Um, there, a lot of people are, a lot of those folks are committed to philanthropy. There's a lot of capital available there. You look at the Gates Giving Pledge members, a lot of those folks have also made their money in commerce and through innovation. Mm -hmm. So that's another sort of uh, set of individuals that we hope we can begin this discussion. So that's the individual philanthropist who has decided I want to give a lot of money to good. How do you get them to think about I should invest in early stage, high risk things that move a sector forward, and then think about a market-based approach? How would you? How would you the second one is easier because I think you have a lot of people who are looking for market-based approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is why we do the blog posts, right? You want to, you want to begin to, to have that engagement and say, okay, uh, how, let's think of philanthropy not as charity. Mm -hmm. Here is, likes to make this distinction. That charity is giving the money away. Mm -hmm. uh, philanthropy is, is, is driving a, a, a broad social benefit. Charity also, charity is a part of philanthropy, but mm -hmm. philanthropy more generally is is is, is advancing our, our collective well-being. Right. And it's not necessarily grants. You know, Pierre initially, when quickly after eBay went public, he, he, he committed to uh, putting the, the lion's share of his wealth to active use for the for the betterment of mankind. Right. He created first a foundation. Right? And you've heard this story, but I'll share it with the group here. It's like it's essential to how we think about things. Pierre first created a foundation because he said that's how people do philanthropy. That's what you do. You create a foundation and give money away to organizations that are doing good work. Right. 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 It's so obvious. Sometimes you, you, know, you buy a plane, you buy an alley, you do a foundation. <laughs> 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 
you know, so it's, it's what you do. But he pretty quickly felt constrained because he said, hold on, I created this thing called eBay, mm -hmm. which created a million jobs, $60 billion worth of economic activity. Mm -hmm. and I didn't accept any charter, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and that's not to say that business is always the answer, but hey, right. you know, the, the business was able, in this case, to have a significant positive impact on society. Right. So why, if I'm focused on having a significant positive impact on society, do I only do rent? Right? Right. It's like putting you know, time on handy on the back in the social right. change game. Right. So, so that's why he then created um, uh, the, the, uh, an LLC, an, an investing entity, so that we have now a foundation investment entity side by side. I didn't go into the le legal details of that, but that's what enables us, us to invest across right. the entire team. Right. So that's the discussion I'd like to have with philanthropists who are committed to social change. It's like, right. why, why tie a handy on your back? Why, why not get an entire team? suite of tools you have to drive social change? Okay, so, so it's probably it, that's one group. <clears throat> giving is the answer. And then they have the market over here. That's one thing that we have <coughs> to so, yeah, to build that bridge. How do you get it? philanthropist to realize that you have a whole suite of tools, that you have these problems you want to address, and sometimes investing is the answer. Getting the think that investing is the answer or the whole suite? Well, the whole suite of tools, yeah. that investing is one of the answers. Yeah. Yeah. Investing is part of that same answer. Yeah, I, I think uh, the best place to start is those who already are convinced that investing is part of the answer. Right. And I think there are a lot of those right. uh, to have this conversation with. Um, and then you have to get them to go earlier stage. So you can't give. How do you get them to take more risk to do the early stage things? To, you know, to kind of take one for the team in some kind of sense to, to build a sector. Yeah, that's that's the that's the core challenge. Yeah. Um, I think you highlight the potential and the impact of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of philanthropists who are committed to just doing good, and they want to find the most efficient, effective way of doing it. And they care less about getting credit. Right? This is not about getting credit, it's not about generating the high returns. And again, that's the easy stuff. It's high risk, or I'm sorry, high returns, high social impact. Right. That's the easy stuff, you know, the, the trophy investments. Right. I, I think there are people who are committed to social change, who are willing to invest early stage, and, and we just need more of a, uh, I think, providing an intellectual framework for how one might go about that mm -hmm. is one step in the right direction mm -hmm. and really one of the one of the purposes of putting out the block series. And what, and how is the media going to act in a different way in the next year or two based on your realization you don't want to just invest in the firm, you want to invest in the sector and the things that maybe if it fails, the sector moves forward, there's a, it's, it's an evolutionary step forward for the next business. Will that change your profile for risk? Will that cause you to invest earlier stage yourself? Well, so. Since inception, we focused on sector development. Right. Yeah. These are, this is getting the ideas out there. Um, the evolution for us over the last several years is to uh, relax this constraint on risk-adjusted returns and think of the, the total total impact, total social impact in the firm. So that's the idea. that's that point of evolution for us. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, how we evolve, I think we'll probably invest in a similar way, mm -hmm. um, but I think we'll spend more time pulling the lessons learned mm -hmm. and sharing the lessons learned and uh, sharing some of the things that didn't work as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things about our early stage is it's like in the valley here. Uh, a lot of your deals aren't going to work. Right. And unfortunately, in the, in the social sector, people don't like to talk, generally, people yeah. don't like to talk about their deals that didn't work. Right, right. And I think part of investing in early stage is realizing that a reasonably high percentage of them, that's yeah. like in the valley, are not going to work. Right. But each of them should hopefully Yield some insight, but sure. again, can help the sector. Can you tell me an example from your portfolio of a deal that moved the sector forward? Was it evolution? Was it was a positive evolution that uh, looked at as an investment? You know, kind of with us. Yeah. So we, uh, probably the. I didn't prep you for this part. <laughs> well, I, I think that some some of our uh, most significant disappointments have been have been in microfinance, where we do a lot of our early early investing. As you, you know, you, you remember us from. Uh, we still do a lot of investing in financial inclusion, but there were hiccups in, in the microfinance market. You know, and, and I mentioned Nicaragua. We had some funds invested in Nicaragua, there were other places. Um, and this is one of the this is one of those things. People will say, oh, "Okay, you know, commercial microfinance earning these high rates of return," and they forget, you know, all sort of the, the, the things that didn't work along the way. Right. 
and, and by the way, that's that's going to be one of the challenges. Is one of the challenges we didn't talk about is if we we really need some successful investments to prove a point around impact investment, mm -hmm. right? And this is what one of the dangers of subsidy, right? If you subsidize a lot of firms that ultimately are never able to scale, then I think you can bring a little bit of cynicism about the sector. Mm -hmm. If, however, you invest in say four or five firms and one is able to attain massive scale, mm -hmm. then that's good for the, good for the sector. Right. And, and, and so, so there's this there's this strange sort of risk adversity uh, that sometimes can get in the way of, right. of scaling up. <coughs> the, the new this speaks also the importance of the nuances around the subsidy that we really got to be careful when we when right. we When the subsidy makes sense, and how do you make that decision? It's it's a tough decision. Um, I think there are, there are several factors. Um, the firm's contribution moving the sector forward, as we've discussed, is one important factor. Um, size of the market and the disposable income of the customers that you're trying to serve are two, most, two other very critical factors. Obviously, a small so market. So, reach of the poor folks that you reach, have doing the subsidy to enable you to reach the, the poor customers. Yes, yeah, so an example I used last night, which is a good one, is we funded a, we invested in BRACS, microfinance. Uh, initiatives in Sierra Leone and Liberia. We didn't go in expecting those adjusted returns. Those are more small, war torn markets yeah. with lots of asset poverty. And if you, you are, in, in that investment, we're trying to just give people an opportunity to, to, to move up from that abject poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our mobile money investments, mm -hmm. so we're investing in a, a mobile money plan in Asia mm -hmm. that is serving above the basis of then it seems to me we should be expecting risk adjusted returns. Because the customers have some money and customers have money exposed to a relatively large market. So, yeah. so that should be closer to being able to take off and being in a, a straight commercial market. Right. And so in Sierra Leone and Liberia, what is what is success? What will success be if you execute well, like don't go to market rate, don't go to risk adjusted returns? Yeah, it would be interesting if Susan Davis was here from, from RAC. But I think if we if if if, if that entity is sustainable. And that's that's the first that's the first um, uh, hurdle to clear. Then after after that, is how much can we how much cash flow can we generate to expand uh, expand the the, uh, the efforts there? Mm -hmm. Zero one mm -hmm. You make it grow in that particular <coughs> geography. Yes. So there's, there's still a big change of thinking that has to happen for an investor who is used to putting money in a fund or to, as a fund into a company. Into an enterprise, into a business, and then to say, I'm also investing in the roads that get me to that business on high street. How do, you, how do people have to act differently and think differently to, to take the sector approach? I think I think it goes back to finding people who are prepared to think of them in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, that person who's focused on risk adjusted returns, they're not going to be convinced by the, the, the sure. six block six block process. There are folks who, you know, they want to save the world and no discount. Yeah, that's, no. that's, yes, so that, that's not necessarily the target here. No. One, one, one pool of capital we didn't talk about is the development banks and institutions, right. right? And they historically have invested in businesses. And you see USAID, DFID, uh, OPEC with some of their work, uh, increasingly interested in early stage investments. So I think that's an additional pool of capital where you have people who do have investment skills who are committed to positive social impact, uh, who are looking at earlier stage. I think there's I think there is some positive movement there as well. well. So it's I think really hard to see up with like we had a session today or I think it's today with the, the, the development finance institution friend of the foe because they, they exist in their own time zone and timeline and, and they don't move at the, at the pace of an investor. Yeah there are there you know each of us have, each of us has our own constraints. Right. And, sure. um, and there are certain constraints working with government entities. But there are fabulous, very impressive people working in those organizations who are yeah. absolutely committed yeah. and who can occasionally break through those barriers and, and deliver the results. So I, I, I do think I'm still optimistic that we can see some progress there uh, among foundations with their, their ability to think about sectors and, and policy. I think there's some opportunity there. Uh, high net worth individuals, I think, is a, is a huge untapped opportunity. By the way, let's not just talk about high net worth individuals in the US, right? You're really seeing emerging wealth elsewhere. You know, in, 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 in Latin America or in India or in China, um, that the emergence of the whole philanthropic 
sector and ethos in other countries outside of the U.S. is also fascinating. Right. Right. And the, even for those investors, they're willing. And they, they, how do they think about their impact? How do they think about what their money has done in terms of how do you, how do you measure impact across the sector? I mean, I guess that's what you have to be looking at, right? It's not just what, you know, Bridge Academy is one of your examples. You know, it's, it's a particular private school in Kenya and going to other places. But you want to say, how am I growing this whole sector? How do I, how, because they, they, they're, they're, there's a sense of agency that the investor often wants. They want to say, what's my money done? Yes. And if I'm willing to take a reduced uh, rate of return to get this kind of impact, how do I, how do I get a sense of, of what I've done with this sector? The, the bridge example uh, is, is reasonably straightforward. I think we know about sector impact. You see many bridges sprouting up around the world. Right? Mm -hmm. You see people say, aha, isn't that interesting what they're doing? I can do it. Right? Mm -hmm. I can learn from what they're doing. Maybe I can do it a little better. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's success, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of our other investments is, is D-Life, which sells solar lanterns. And they've now impacted more than a million lives with their solar lanterns. Have the cost of the solar lantern down to eight bucks, right? Mm -hmm. for, for a kid who needs to study and, and doesn't have electricity, is dependent upon kerosene. This is potentially a transformative product. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just D-Light right now. Mm -hmm. There are right. others entering the market. There's so D-Light can yeah. say, okay, we we're in, and so are these others. So they've actually not really contributed to, to, to really pushing the market forward. Mm -hmm. does, does there need to be some level of sector-based intermediaries who are telling these stories and <coughs> explaining how to be the next D-Light, how to be the next bridge? Is there some kind of role for an organization there, like mixed did for microfinance? I think there probably is, and it probably depends upon the sector and depends upon uh, uh, country as well. One of the things that we're hopeful happens over time, because we now have, uh, we have the office in Johannesburg, the office in, in uh, Mumbai, uh, we also have an office in, in London, and over time may open out elsewhere, is we like to get this, this transmission mechanism going where you can get innovations uh, spread quickly across the world. Um, there's a lot of South-South solutions that, that, that right. potentially can emerge. And if we have people who are in each of those markets, uh, they can help transmit the learning. We're already seeing this, by the way, haven't talked about it, but Minyar Network does work that's not just in that investing. Mm -hmm. We do work in property rights. We do work in technology for transparency and accountability. Right. Right. And there's actually a really good example there of, a, of, of, of getting that innovation transmitted. Uh, and I was just reading about it this morning. There's a terrific organization we support in India uh, it has a website called i88ride.com, <laughs> which is okay. pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And it enables people to lodge their complaints or the, where, where they had to play, pay, pay a bribe. And it's such a fabulous idea that now, uh, with some assistance from OAN, a lot of it happening organically, they're in, in, in a dozen countries, and they just, uh, just saw an email this morning about them launching in Greece. Really? Um, yeah. So there's some of these really interesting, interesting people being really transparent about, yes, I really paid a bribe on the Okay. Well, then that's a little tricky. You know, if we have another hour, we can discuss all the ins and outs of that. That's a, that's a little bit tricky. But but there, the location of the ride, the type of ride, why they paid it, and it can have an impact, right? Because um, uh, Swati, who's, who's the CEO there, was explaining to me that the transport minister in uh, Bangalore was upset that he seemed to have a high rate of bribery. So he actually sat down with them and kind of re-engineered some of those processes so there are fewer bribe taking options. Mm -hmm. So there are ways that some of these innovations can practically have an impact on the ground. My broader point of that is, yeah. how do we take these innovations and accelerate the spread of those innovations? Right. Because if it's relevant in India, it's relevant in Greece, it's relevant in many, many other places around the world. Right. And so that's a different way, that's a non-commercial way, it's a non-commercial example, right. but an example of how you actually can create a sector not only within, within a geography, but across multiple geographies. Right. How do you get people to do the earlier stage risk capital and where the gap is, is, is really, uh, is huge. A 250000 to a million dollar deal, something that could be transformative, but it's really high risk. How do you move, how do you move capital into that gap? I think you fundamentally have to appeal to their sense that they want to have the biggest possible impact. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's where you're going to have the biggest possible impact. Because <coughs> if you're investing in later stage, risk adjusted returns, you're actually not being incremental. You're not driving that additional positive change that we all want to see. So I think you need to appeal to the sense of, hey, here's a point 
where you actually can be in it, the very beginning, right. fundamentally create a sector, fundamentally change the trajectory mm -hmm. of a sector that mm -hmm. can be massively scaled up. Mm -hmm. And then to, to assess the risk around that, around a particular country, a particular geography, a particular market, who needs to help guide those, I, mean, I guess we're talking about individual angels who want to see those sorts of deals. I think it's going to make sense of that opportunity. Yeah, I think it's going to take more resources on the ground with yeah. the right skills, and it's going to take development over time. Yeah. You know, it's fundamentally, I mean, our experience is you need, uh, you need people who are very familiar with that market, and it takes a while to build that expertise. I mean, we're very fortunate we've been able to hire some exceptional investment professionals right. who, who have that expertise, but we also need to develop more of that over time so we can be making those bets. We also need to develop in the overall entrepreneurial ecosystem in these countries, like Endeavor is doing. Right. So you have more entrepreneurs emerge who, who, who have uh, mentorship and access to other uh, professionals. It's interesting, I was talking to somebody from Endeavor, and he said, you know, the, the macroeconomic environment is important for entrepreneurship in the country, but perhaps the most critical factor is the, the network of entrepreneurs that are existing in that country. Mm -hmm. And Endeavor has a terrific, example from Argentina, where they show, they, they demonstrate that Argentina has a very high percentage of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, including a lot of tech entrepreneurs, and how they were all, how they're all connected. And by the way, many of them happen to have been connected through Endeavor, mm -hmm. um, but how they've all connected and collectively assisted the uplift in the entire uh, entrepreneurial environment in, in, uh, in Argentina. And now you have some of the early entrepreneurs spinning out to be the early venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this, by the way, that in turn, talking about entrepreneurial ecosystems, there's this view that some hold that, hey, we just gotta make the next Silicon Valley in the mm -hmm. country. Right. Like, I, I think that's, that's, that's a pipe dream. I think it starts with these early networks of entrepreneurs and finding ways to support these entrepreneurs so that they can uh, build on each other's learnings and understandings and, and mistakes mm -hmm. and kind of build that from the ground up. So that, that whole entrepreneurial ecosystem Right. If you've done this six-part series uh, of blogs, what would be the ideal outcome for these ideas? What would be the next stage that you'd want to get these ideas out? Who would you want to get? <laughs> what would you want to see happen? I, I think the first thing is a, is, is a vigorous debate, a discussion will emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you put ideas out there, uh, you want them not necessarily to be taken up and adopted per se, but in, our, in this case, for people to engage with those ideas, mm -hmm. and uh, for that to be risked for their thinking right. that ultimately informs their actions. Right. So the first step here is it's not, okay, now we plug, publish the blog post, let's see $200 million flowing to early stage. Right. Right. It's okay, here, here are, that would be good, but that's yeah. a little unrealistic, uh, at least yeah. in the first week or two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but the point is to get the ideas out there, mm -hmm. to engage with those people who really want to engage with them. Uh, for whom these may be influential in terms of how they think about having impact in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what we want to make. That is success, really, is that we have represented individuals from the various pools of capital we talked about saying, hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. This sparks some thinking. Let's talk some more. Who do you see this as being most challenging to? This new idea of investing in the sector. Who, who's, whose world is it rock? You know, I, I, I you know, challenging, so it could be challenging for those who are just thinking about always wanting to risk investment returns, right? right? I'm not sure it's gonna rock their world, per se. Right. Uh, it sh this should not be a threat to anybody, right? right. This, should, this should be- They won't accept it, but it won't rock it. <laughs> yeah, but it's some might accept it. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you're a commercial capital player, yeah. you want this deal flow, right? right? right. You want this deal flow, so you right. could be, you know, you're probably cheering on those guys who are going to really safe. Right. You may not want to do it yourself, right. but you want somebody climbing the bump so that you get that water flowing. Right? Right. So I, I think this is really added into the sector. Right. And it's the people who are trying to think, okay, how can I help my biggest, where, is, where am I going to get the biggest bang for my back? Where am I going to get the biggest social impact? And we're saying, look, go early stage where you can not only spark a new market, but you can change the trajectory of market. That's where the leverage is. Any line you see, the, the most leverage you get in that line is changing what happens over those first couple of years. Right. So, so those are the people we, we want to target, are the people who are, are excited about having the biggest possible. Right. I mean, I think 
biggest problem in the sector that I see at this point is that there's not enough early stage risk capital, is what you're talking about. It's, it's priming the fund financial things. How would you tell the community, if you could just elaborate on it again, how would you tell folks it's okay to take that risk? And you know, you might make less money, you might not be risk adjusted, market rate return, you might move the whole sector together. How would you get folks to have a different attitude toward risk? Control risk flows from the attitude about where you want to have impact. Right. It flows from saying, okay, I got it. Impact in the sector is where I can have the biggest possible impact. Okay? Mm -hmm. Once you get people sort of committed to that notion, then you say, okay, now let's talk about what's needed to move in the entire sector. Mm -hmm. It's early stage commercial investing. It's infrastructure. It's policy. Okay, that sounds really complicated, but I get policy. And I want to help them. Mm -hmm. Or that sounds really complicated, policy, infrastructure, but I'm really good at early stage investing. Why don't I learn this and that in Silicon Valley? I think it might be relevant. Why don't I put my shoulder against this early stage investing piece? Mm -hmm. You know, we realize, again, we're in a privileged position, though, and we can have all, the, all the, the, the types of capital that we need to deploy in moving right. the sector. Right. Some folks may just have one type of capital. So the big, the big thing is, think about the sector. The next thing is, where are you gonna have the most leverage? We think it's early stage. Right. And then it is, okay, what kind of early stage investing are, are you going to commit to? Have you, do you have a case where you're happy having lost 93%? Yes, yeah, so we support a lot of organizations that uh, are grant-based organizations that are doing uh, doing fabulous work. Right? Mm -hmm. Endeavor, I decided several times. Yeah. Uh, we, we have uh, invested uh, uh, $15 million or so in grants. We also invested in something that have the Catalyst Fund. It's called the Catalyst Fund, where um, we have provided them grant capital and they're going to use that capital to invest in the entrepreneurs they've supported. Mm -hmm. And then the returns on, those, on that capital is going to come back and fund the not for profit. Right. Right? So it's a very clever way of using grant money to create a sustainable enterprise. So right. uh, we, 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 we really done a lot of investments straight grant. By the way, in Rack and Liberia, we did a $3 million grant for, for healthcare activities. Right. And, and so that's sometimes the right way to go. Yeah. But again, it's the right tool in the, in the, in the, in the right time. So we've talked about sectors, we probably should have elaborated on what sectors make sense to you in the video right now. So I think people got to choose the sectors they think are going to have the biggest impact and right. where they can have, right. where they can make a, a discernible right. difference. Right. Um, so a few of the sectors we've looked at, we looked at consumer, we looked at consumer internet and mobile, we invest in consumer internet and mobile in the U.S. Uh, and in the developing world. Being up in Silicon Valley, many of us work for uh, high-tech startups that serve in our DNA a little bit. It's a very comfortable place for us to be. Uh, one sector that's related to that that I've talked about is, uh, is mobile payments. Um, again, something we care deeply about. We used to run PayPal years ago. I think uh, if you get payments down and get mobile down, it's transformative not only from a financial inclusion perspective, but you're really laying the rails for a whole host of additional economic activity because mobile is so incredibly well penetrated. Consumer internet, mobile payments. Consumer internet, mobile payments. Uh, the broad, mobile payments is part of a broader look at financial inclusion includes right. mobile payments. Uh, we do education uh, in the developing world, like with Bridge and a couple of investments in India. We also do education. We're looking at education in the U.S. as well. Uh, for disadvantaged populations in the U.S. You should mention financial inclusion. We're looking at the U.S. We have some investments in the U.S. as well, financial inclusion. Um, and we have this sort of broad banner of entrepreneurship that we, we tuck a few things under. Mm -hmm. And I also mentioned uh, property rights and, and uh, technology for transparency and accountability. You did a big report on medical technology a couple of years ago. Are you pushing that sector? That We're looking at that sector, and, and it's developing more slowly than, 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 than we had thought. Yeah. Uh, but we still see some really interesting things there, and it's, it's potentially so transformative. You have medical uh, devices, for example, that are really expensive here in the, in the West that you could deliver at, at much lower cost and yield substantial benefit in other markets around the world. Mm -hmm. But that's moving more slowly. It's moving more slowly than we, than we would like. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there are innovations. Uh, regulation is, is, is a challenge. Um, the ecosystem is a challenge. All those things that McKinsey highlighted, they still need to be put in place. And, and there's a shortage of organizations, to our point. There's a shortage of organizations committed to doing that. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. But we'll continue at it because it, it can be so impactful.
And so you've done this blog series. What's the continuing outreach around these ideas that you can be involved in? Well, I'll leave that to, to uh, our communications uh, folks. Yeah. Uh, but no, we, we, wanna, we want to uh, ideally, uh, the, the, the dialogue continues with everybody here in the room. Yeah. Right? And well, that's, a, that's a long, exhaustive dialogue, I suppose, that we started with today. But uh, no, the point is that hopefully these ideas uh, are ideas that become the subject of discussion and debate and help influence thinking. Um, we obviously we want to be, continue to be engaged ourselves, right. and we'll be participating in various venues to continue to reinforce some of the some of the key messages. And we want to be listening too, yeah. right? Because there's a set of ideas. It's like, okay, let's let's get the feedback. What's, I'm going to open up to folks in just a minute. But what's been some of the most interesting responses to the blog series so far? What, what have people written? To well, overall, I think it's been quite positive, and we've been very encouraged. Yeah, there have been some very generous comments that people have have, have provided. Um, one of the a couple of the interesting points, one that I referred to before, was like, okay, you guys are are privileged, privileged in the sense that you have a pretty significant pool of capital, and you can invest across the entire entire continuum. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a completely fair point. Again, my my uh, additional comment to that be, would be. Yes, but just pick your point, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't pick the point where you think you're going to have the biggest impact. Right. And think a little more sector. Yeah. A lot of people at the earlier stage, but you know everybody can have something to uh, contribute here. The issue around total uh, total firm value, yeah. I think, resonates really well. I think people have been struggling with how to think about the subsidy issue, mm -hmm. and people have lined up in two camps mm -hmm. rather than thinking about under what circumstances it might make sense to come off a risk adjusted work return. This is, I think, is still a vestige from what SOCAP has uh, helped address so well, which is this artificial division between a, a grant world and an investment world. Right. There's still vestiges of that. I mean, that, that, that is still a, a, an instinct, is right. subsidy good, subsidy bad. And what are all right. the constituents that are around that? So those are the things that... that, that and the, the, the total firm value, that what's it delivering to the sector, that, 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 what's it giving beyond the balance of the company? Correct. That's one of the things. And I think, that, I think the role of policy yeah. is also one. Yeah. By the way, they've just been stunning. The, the, the sector has been stunning in silence on the issue of policy. Yeah. Right. right. So that's that's been that's been one that has also emerged. Right. right. And so, looking at five years, what would you like to see happen in this space? More early stage investment, committed and moving sector. Right. That's that's the simple explanation of of, of you know the, the 27 pages of our discussion and and the, the, the presentation last night. It's, Go early stage, think about sectors. Right. And what scares you the most? What, what do you see as the biggest risk? I think the biggest risk is that there's too much hype around impact investing and transformative impact impact investing, and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, and and he mentioned the, the ratio of talk to deals. Mm -hmm. And and it, it had sort of a knowing, there was a knowing chuckle of, 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 across the across the audience. I think social impact bonds are quite promising, yeah. but I, I think that most of the capital in, in, that has been flowing into impact investing has been the capital that's look, still looking for risk adjusted returns in all right. cases. And risk adjusted returns without a lot of, without a lot of risk and pretty advanced. Right. Yeah. So I think we as a sector, I, I'm totally committed to this notion that there are market based solutions to some of our most intractable problems, or that markets have a significant role to play in addressing some of our most intractable problems. And the impact investing is a, is, a, is a critical component of that. But I think we need to do the things that ensure that we can prime the pump to invest early stage, to move the sectors, such that we get these fabulous investable opportunities that we, that, we, that we go to scale. Now, success in five years is we have five microfinances. Right, in terms of, uh, of solutions that we scale to, to 200 million and above, right? If we if we can say, hey, the solar lighting, um, uh, uh, mobile payments, and and um, uh, public uh, private low cost private education are now serving, you know, 50 million a piece, fabulous, right? Because right now people talk about promise and impact investing, and they default to the microfinance example, which we default to as well, because it illustrates so many points well about market development. But we need more. And I think there are more at that cusp. We just need to get more people committed to them. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. We want to open this up to questions. Yeah. 
Apple said, no, we can get a grant of $250,000 is equal, if not greater, than the amount of share of to get even a current impact investment. So, you know, this whole notion of, of, of these the, the grants and, and the investment is risky from the full profit standpoint. I don't think it's risky. I think it's just it's uncertain. They understand what they're getting with the grant. And they're just giving the money away. It's, 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 we don't know what to do with this. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, think, I think it's a definitional thing. So to me, I think a lot of it is sort of saying, you know, the same way the angel community evolved 15, 20 years ago in, in, in BC investing, that's where philanthropy has to get to. Is that they're an angel around. Well, and and they lose if they just write it down as a grant. Right, so you make, you make several interesting points embedded in there. By the way, our, my experience with OAN is it's, 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 it's actually we, we do a lot more due diligence on the investments than we do on the grants. But we still do a lot of due diligence on both of them, but I can understand how that's not we're the other perspective operation, you are a huge outlier. Okay. <laughs> so, so in terms of, um, I mean, there, there absolutely does need to be some, uh, some innovation here. I think um, this is where the development institutions are actually pretty good. Is they're willing to take different tranches of risk and different, around different return expectations. And there's some pretty interesting structure, including, by the way, social impact bonds, where, where there are different, different, could be different tranches. So I, I, think, I think that the structures of financial architecture or innovations exist. You come back to the other point you're making, though. Who wants to, and we've been in these negotiations, right? So if, there, if there's different tranches, you know, who wants to take the first loss tranche, right? Because everybody, well, I'm, I'm accountable to so-and-so to get the money back plus a little bit. So, so the, 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 the tranching is innovative, absolutely terrific approach. It can work. You're still stuck with this issue that you've highlighted several times. How do you get people to commit capital flexibly in a high-risk way? Uh, and how do you fundamentally tell somebody, look, you're going to be climbing the pump for this guy to make better returns? And, and so you've got to appeal to the, the, the sense that people want to have their biggest, that their objective is not the return, it's the, funny, it's the social impact. And sometimes it's, it's a willingness to take that low return tranche that is going to be ultimately the most catalytic. And that's, that's the argument you have to make. You have to appeal to the better angels, you have to appeal to the desire to have the biggest positive social impact. I think there are enough people out there that if we can convince them with about the importance of early stage, we can move the needle. So convincing them about the importance of the early stage. Is there one more question? Somebody asked a question. Hi, Chris. Any more general small network of angel investors? I know Global Technology is a small space. My question is, how well they I think, I, think it's quite, I think it's quite promising. I mean, Kickstarter has been enormously successful and, and, and spawned a very cottage, cottage industry there. So I think it's one of those innovations that's incredibly exciting, uh, potentially transformative, uh, still very young, so we'll, we'll have to follow very closely. Okay, I want to thank everybody for being here and for listening to this.